Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the live Q&A sessions. Uh, sorry for the delay. There was some technical difficulties. Uh, brought it out thanks to Joe. So uh, welcome, uh, Matt and Lucy. Lucy is uh, coming in uh, for uh, live leisure. Yeah. So welcome for uh, Matt and Lucy. Um, so there are a number of questions that uh, the audience uh, send in their question to the chat box via Vuva app. So I think the way we go about it is that I would ask the questions that some, uh, some question, I mean, both of you can answer. Some questions have been addressed directly to Matt or Leisho. So I will address those to you. Um, does that sound okay to you, uh, Matt and Lucy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that sounds okay. great. Yep. Um, so let's go with the first questions. Um, how do we protect the, the integrity of survivors while we use their story image in advocacy and work? So any of you would like to start first? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think, you know, one great place to start is asking yourself, would I share this image or this story if it was myself or a family member, a daughter, a sister, a brother, um, your mom? Uh, and then I think another great thing is to ask yourself and ask your team, could sharing this story have any long-term or short-term consequences that are negative for this person? Um, is it going to impact their life in a negative way? Um, and then a thing that we always do is we try to hand as much post-editing uh, uh, access to survivors as possible. Um, and then ultimately, you want someone who is the, the person whose story is being shared to look at that story, look at that image, and see something positive in themselves. See um, perhaps that they are strong, that they are resilient, that they have overcome something difficult, um, but that ultimately there is a positive light to that in the end. And you know, I, I looked up uh, integrity earlier, uh, and mm -hmm. integrity has to do with being honest, and integrity, the other definition, also has to do with being whole. So mm -hmm. are we being honest in the way that we tell stories, and are we telling a whole story? or are you telling just one version or one part of the story? That's right, yeah, that's great. So Matt, uh, would you like to uh, jump in on that? Um, I wouldn't have much to add to that. I mean, it's storytelling about these issues that we're all um, focused on has come a long way in the last few years for sure from you know pictures of girls in chains and, and those kind of emotive uh, images that originally were thought to be a required part of, of, of what we're doing here. But I mean, one thing I would say is um, there's a there's hundred ways to take uh, photos and obviously photos are a big. Hi, Matt, um, can you hear us? I think we are losing you a bit. Um, uh, there seem to be uh, issues with the internet connections. Uh, so Matt is kind of like pause now. So maybe we just uh, continue talking and then I think Matt can uh, join us back. So I think, I mean, both, I mean, Lucy and Matt, I mean, have been, uh, you have been giving the answer to this, but I think there's uh, some, uh, maybe some concerns among the, the NGOs who are using the image in the advocacy work. Some are using like the, the the realities um, uh, image of the survivor, and some are using maybe some other techniques in how to present the image. So like ethical photos, shooting, something like that. So maybe Lucy, would you like to say something about that? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think, don't want to jump in for Matt, but I think maybe what he was going towards is that there's any number of ways to be really creative in how you visually present a story. Um, obviously, people are very drawn in by images, people are very drawn in by stories, and it's a beautiful way to share about what you're doing. Um, but I think there's a number of ways that you could conceal, for example, identity in an image that's very creative. Um, and you can also just use stock photos, uh, for example, or a um, thing that we do at Freedom Story is we will not, if we're talking about a negative or a derogatory um, thing that's happening in a story, for example, about abuse or mental health struggles, we won't show someone's face. And uh, sometimes we use a stock image in that instance as well. Hi, Matt is back. So um, while you were away, so I mean, we talk about like how to use the image, but uh, if you'd like to pick it up from, from where you were saying before the, the internet connection uh, cut you out, uh, please, please do, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm not sure where you lost me there, but I was just saying that it, to, if for anyone who's interested, have a look on the on Thomson Reuters Foundation website, the trafficking and slavery coverage, and there's you see many examples, creative ways to to do what Lucy was just explaining. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So maybe I move on to the next question, so, which is more about uh, broader issues like what to consider in storytelling to capture the target audience and convey call to action? The question was asked by Melanie Olano. Yes. Great Matthew, question. Like to start first? Or, um, um, I mean, in journalism, we're not really uh, looking for a call to action. So Lucy can probably speak more about that. We're just presenting, you know, stories and facts. And uh, uh, about capturing an audience, one technique that I find is really good um, is to have a, a contrast between uh, something that's really relatable. You know, you might start a story with something about, about the subject or the situation that's really relatable, something that, that will make a person, you know, read it as if it's a, a normal everyday occurrence and then um, dive into the situation that something, can, you know, something, you know, the bad, the, the negative part of the story. And this, this kind of technique really helps to, I guess, um, show how trafficking and slavery does touch every part of society. You know, it can happen anywhere to, to anyone. Um, See, I think you need to, you, to capture the audience, you need to have something relatable in there, something that, that is an everyday kind of thing so that people aren't being hit with things that are completely foreign to them from go when they're reading the story. Um, yeah, I mean, Lucy can probably speak more about call to action and, and other parts of that question. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, Lucy. Absolutely. Yeah, I really agree with Matt. I think establishing, you know, the universal human experience is a really important part of storytelling. Um, to be able to connect people with a topic and maybe a culture or a people group that they are not necessarily familiar with and that they're not going to experience in their everyday life, but doing that in a way that will help them understand bringing it close to home, as Matt said, making it something that they can relate to, I think is a great way to draw people into your um, communications. I also think this is a great chance for you to consider how can you educate and mature your donors. Um, people are interacting with your communications because they want to learn. They want to learn more about the work that you're doing. They want to learn more about the topic that you're working on. This is not merely just, um, I think we very easily can boil communications and NGOs down to just fundraising and I have to hook them in and I have to make sure that we can get people to give. And that is certainly part of it. But I think, you know, to consider how you can educate people and mature their understanding of the topic um, is also a really important uh, piece of communications. Great, thank you. Um, so there's this question addressed to you back uh, from Crowded OPV. Uh, we see a lot in the media about journalists in Cambodia being detained for speaking out against issues, which is a violation of freedom of speech. Do you find the same challenge in your work? Yeah, but, I mean, Cambodia is not the um, happiest place to be a journalist. Uh, and we have seen an increase in the number of arrests recently. Um, you do have to be very careful, but what I would say is if you look at, if you have a look at those arrests of late, uh, a lot of them have been of um, what we, 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 you know, they go down as journalists, but they're often uh, people who are running kind of independent Facebook news sites. And, um, you know, they're often, they, there's certain pressure points that you can touch, you know, um, in, in places like Cambodia. And, and this is key. I mean, you need to learn. I've been here for eight years and you really need to learn um, how to kind of play. We can say play the game without, um, you know, getting yourself sent to, sent to prison. Um, it is definitely a concern of mine all the time. But I, I should say as well that, and this is, follows on from what I said about the kind of people that have been arrested. I mean working for the Thompson Reuters Foundation does give you um, a bit of, you know, I won't call it protection, but, you know, it's different for the government to go after, you know, a, 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 sing, a man who has a Facebook live and reports news on there than it is to go after someone like myself. And at the same time, um, you know, the Thompson Reuters Foundation has these built-in principles of journalism that um, we have to live up to and, uh, if we are true to those, in, in most cases, um, we will stay out of trouble. But, you know, as, as everyone knows, in 
uh, countries like this, you know, sometimes you don't have to do the wrong thing to be um, charged with doing the wrong thing. So yeah, it is a, it's a touchy situation, but we're dealing with it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think that's a tough situation. But I think we have uh, to make a careful uh, decisions on how we go about doing things. Um, well, there's another question that just came in uh, for la for Lachos, but maybe Lucy, you can uh, reply to these questions. Um, the question asks, how do you communicate and advocate this standard to the donor organization? At some time, they have different expectation and understanding about this issue. Oh, that's a really great question. Um, yeah. I think, you know, you have maybe two different kinds of donors. If you think about it in that way, you might have individuals and you have institutions and the power dynamic between the organization and an individual might be slightly more balanced than between the organization and an institution. Um, but again, I think it really goes back to donor maturation and um, to put it really bluntly, sticking to your guns. If you have a rule that you don't tell stories of minor survivors, don't break that rule just for the funding. This again is another opportunity to share with a donor why. And that's really important to help people understand why is this something that's important to your organization? Why is this something that's important to your child protection policy or to your ethical storytelling policy? And um, how can you help the donor understand your perspective and maybe even offer to help them come up with an ethical storytelling policy or an ethical storytelling framework for them with their other grantees? I think that can be a really great um, opportunity to kind of engage in a two-way conversation as opposed to feeling like it's just the power dynamic is, is in one direction. Great. Okay. So um, I think there's another question that kind of like follow up on this. Maybe that both of you can help answer. Uh, the question was asked by Alan Valdez. How do we ensure confidentiality of the case if we will engage survivor in storytelling? So maybe with your source, your um, survival stories, how, how do you help uh, to keep confidentiality of uh, your source? So Matt, would you like to start? Sure, I mean, uh, to, to keep the, you meant to keep the identity of your source mm -hmm. hidden. I mean, um, obviously you, you don't, need, I mean, you don't need to use real names and you don't need to use real locations to effectively tell your story, right? So um, easy, easy to use a pseudonym for a survivor in a story. And I mean, the big one is, is, is the photographs. Um, and, and the photographs are really powerful too, because if you were to use a photograph that not only identified, but also, you know, put a survivor, you know, painted a survivor in, a, in the wrong light, this photograph it, it exists forever, right? So especially if it goes on the internet, um, yeah, you just have to be really careful with the photos. Um, and, and as I said, there's a lot of ways to do it. If you, if you, I mean, photographers, photography is an art, right? Like I, I go and report and I often take photos myself, but for some jobs I need a photographer to come along because it is, it is, a, it is a real, a real art. And when you go and take your own photos, you really discover, um, well, when you're taking your photos, actually, you often think they're really good. And then you get home and upload them and look at them on the computer and they're not what you thought. And you, and you really learn that photography is an art. So, I mean, I would suggest that um, just as an additional point that, that NGOs uh, telling these kind of stories, I would suggest that they engage uh, professional photographers because then that takes that all off your plate. The professional photographer is trained in, in all of this stuff and they know how to do it best. So yeah, maybe it's worth everyone investing in, in that if, mm. if they don't already. Great, thanks, thanks, thanks for the tips. Yes, so Lucy, would you like to add on to that? Yeah, um, you know, I think in terms of ensuring confidentiality, everything Matt said is really true. Um, it's really important to engage survivors and caseworkers and um, psychologists or social workers to know what the best thing for that survivor is in terms of confidentiality, whether you obscure a face or a pseudonym or anything like that. Ultimately, we have to do no harm, right? And if we are a sector or an industry that is committed to ending exploitation, we cannot be exploiting people in the way that we tell stories. Um, so that the best, the best interest of the survivor has to come first, ultimately. Um, and sometimes that means not telling a story, even if you think that it would be a great story to be shared. Um, and then I think another option, just really practical, would be to tell a composite story. You could bring together aspects of a few different people's experiences and journeys and tell them in a way that is both truthful, but that does not reveal the identity of one singular person. Yes. 
So I think we have a lot of questions coming in and I think we are filing up. So maybe if you don't mind, we will go over uh, the sessions uh, a little bit um, for some a few minutes. Um, maybe the next question is quite a practical question that came in from Lauren uh, Ellis. How can we make the donor the hero in the story and the organization the guide and support? So I think this is like a, the practical issues that many organizations have to deal with. Yeah. So um, Lucy, if you'd like to start. Yeah, absolutely. I'll just speak very like, briefly about what we do at Freedom Story. We use a lot of um, together language. So together, this is what we've done. We've done because of you, this is what we've done. You know, uh, the dynamic, as I talked about, between an organization and a donor can feel very uneven, but the reality is without them, we don't exist. And so to give them the credit and to have them feel involved in the work, that's what ultimately they're looking for. If they weren't um, interested in wanting to be involved in your work in a meaningful way, they wouldn't be giving to your organization. So how do you involve them in your language? Together we've done this. Because of you, we've been able to do this. Look at the impact that we've had. And ultimately, that's what we're wanting to communicate, right? The impact that we've had together because of the people who are supporting our organization. But also don't take out the fact that um, the organization itself has obviously done a great deal of work. And for me, ultimately, the survivor, the beneficiary, the storyteller, the client, whatever word you want to use, is the person who has done perhaps the hardest work because they've been the one who's overcome something. They've been the one who has developed or improved themselves in different ways. So giving credit where credit is due to all parties um, and making sure people feel included and involved in your communications. Yeah, good. Thank you. Uh, Matt, would you like to add in on that? No, I don't think there's much for me to add to that. That's that's Lucy's. Um, <laughs> okay. Got that covered, I think. <laughs> great, great. I, I think there's a the follow up question that just came in from CJ Lector. Uh, how or can you give tips on how to educate it? Uh, how to educate uh, mature donors? So I think the the question is how how you deal with the educated and the donors that already have a lot of experience in this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, if you are looking to educate and mature donors, think about your communications not merely as a one-off, right? Sometimes I think we can conceptualize that we have one chance, one Facebook post, one email to be able to engage people in your work. And instead, think about how you might set up a theme over a period of time to help people learn about trafficking or learn about the issue that you're working on. How can you have maybe a series of emails that tell stories and share information or data about the, uh, the issue that you're working on? Um, and to just step out almost in faith and realize that while you are reliant on them to continue your own work, they are here to learn and, and, and situate yourself, position yourself as someone who is offering this education to them. We want to help you understand this topic more. We're going to have a three, four week um, series of emails about this. And, um, you know, you're always welcome to reach out and learn more. It's not merely that you have to share a very, uh, sensationalized or impactful story one time and hope that that is the only way that people engage with you, right? The holy grail of fundraising is monthly donors, people who are engaging with you on a monthly basis. If you want that, then ultimately you need to be engaging with people in a two-way conversation as much as possible to be uh, educating them and helping them to understand your topic even more. Exactly. So to keep that uh, conversation going. Um, Matt, I think there's a follow-up question uh, on uh, what you said earlier. In uh, this question was asked by Gigi Tupas. Uh, in doing a documentary of story, what are three important things to ensure we respect and uphold the survivors and the integrities of anti-trafficking, anti-slavery work that we do? Like the top three um, things to make sure that uh, we respect Um, now it seems there's a internet connection issues again um, on that. Um, let's see that I think maybe Matt, can you hear us? Um, no. Mm -hmm. um, maybe Lucy, would you like to uh, jump in on that a little bit about sure. what what are the most important things to consider? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for me, I think the top three things generally, I've, I've not thought a ton about this before, but you can always find out more on ethicalstorytelling.com. Uh, 
But uh, one is to be aware of the power dynamic uh, between yourself and the person whose story is being shared. So uh, regardless of how hard we might work to equalize that power dynamic and empower our um, clients and beneficiaries, there is ultimately going to be a, a service provider and service receiver relationship. So how can you ensure that the person whose story is being told um, is being empowered as much as possible throughout the storytelling process, ensuring not only that you tell them that they have control over their narrative, but that you truly give them control over their narrative and allow them to say what they'd like to share and not share. Uh, and how can you uh, write your communications or position your communications in a way that is um, constituent first and donor second? So for example, at Freedom Story, or I think realistically in general, we live in a globalized world. The um, people that we work with, the people that we are serving, they have social media, they are following your organization on social media, they are going to see what you are posting. And that is the reality of the world that we live in. And so if you are posting something, you have to be sure that it's going to benefit them when they see it and also that they are going to be happy and confident when they see that, that story being shared about them. So considering that, and then I think something I touched on earlier, thinking about that golden rule, um, would I share this story if it was about myself? Would I share this story if it was about a family member, something like that? Yeah, uh, so Matt, we'll come back. Um, what are the top three things uh, to consider to respect and uphold the integrity of the survivor. Uh, I think you were about to say something before you were cut by the internet connection. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry about that. I don't know what's going on the internet here today. Um, I mean, the top three things, I guess, I'm sure Lucy just covered them all, but the consent is obviously the first thing that you have to establish. And when you're getting consent to tell this story, you also need to understand the dynamics of power. If you're someone who has arrived, you know, to a, to a, you know, uh, a, a vulnerable community or an impoverished place or a, a place where these things are happening and you're arriving in an expensive car wearing shiny shoes with jewelry mm. and things, you need to understand that um, just because someone says yes, doesn't know, you know, they, they might feel pressured to say yes. They also, another tricky thing you need to be wary of is um, People in between, as a journalist, I need to be wary of people who are in between myself and the subject, the person that I want to speak to, because um, these activists or NGOs or community leaders uh, also have an agenda to push often, sometimes, and uh, will, you know, um, you know, not fabricate, but will, you know, mold the story a little bit in order to suit their agenda. So you need to be really wary of, of, of people trying to, you know, push this, the story in a certain direction and wonder why, why they'd be doing it. Um, and, and as Lucy said, again, be, be, be true to the story and, uh, and do no harm to your subject. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, this, this question actually was addressed to Leishos, but I think it's, uh, it would be good to hear from both uh, Lucy and Matt on this. Uh, what would your story for look like? I think that could be maybe some different from the NGO perspective or maybe from uh, Thomson Reuters, but uh, how would your story for look like? So Lucy, could you just start? Yeah, great. So Rachel mentioned in her talk, you know, that three-step flow that a lot of NGOs can kind of fall into the, this person, Lucy's in a bad place, Lucy sees the freedom story, and then Lucy is now better. Um, and obviously that is a really realistic part of, of what we hope for, for all of the people that we're working with, right? But I think ultimately, how can you take that narrative and make it more complex? How can you make it an opportunity for people to learn? And for me, how can I highlight what that person has done to improve their own situation? So for example, with Freedom Story, we offer educational scholarships for students, but it's up to the student to go to school, to do their work, and to get the grades that they need to improve their life and the education they need to improve their life. So how can I talk about how the student has worked really hard academically or they've gotten an after school job to help support themselves? How can I highlight that as much as I'm talking about what we as the organization did um, to help support them? Because Ultimately, the story is about the person and the partnership between that person and our uh, organization. Yes, so Matt, uh, is this the same on how you would go about your story for, or you have different way of uh, telling your story? Um, I mean, uh, generally similar, but I mean, we, journalism is obviously a bit different because our, our audience is, is, is different. Um, you know, we, we would often start with, I mean, one, 
when I'm out in the field reporting the story, you know, I might go out for three, four, five days a week and go and uh, meet meet people in a, in a certain area. And while I'm working away doing that, I'm constantly thinking, uh, what's my lead? What's my lead? What's my lead? My, my mm. top of my story, my top sentence. And as I explained earlier, I always wanted to have a, an element of, of uh, you know, every day something to, to engage and then probably flip to something that makes people go, oh, wow, that's, that's not uh, what I was expecting. Um, and I mean, we often start with a little anecdote, something interesting, and then some quotes directly from, from one of the subjects. And then after that, we get into some hard, what we call nut graphs, which are uh, explaining why we're telling the story. Um, which I guess is, is an element that needs to be considered by NGOs as well. One other thing I'd suggest for storytelling, and we've touched on a little bit, is get, in, get into the details and the details that aren't necessarily related to the abuse or the, or the, the, the mental state of the, of the subject, but get into little da daily details of things that you see the person doing. And again, this brings uh, the reader back to, to, to feeling you know, close to the, the person whose story you're trying to tell. Tiny little details about things you see around their house or, or wherever you're interviewing them or their mannerisms or something that, mm -hmm. something that brings a, a real human element to the story can really drag people in and make them feel connected to it. Yes, so great. I think we have had a lot of a great discussions so far and I, I would love to continue doing this, but I think we have a time limit. So maybe I would uh, ask the two of you to give some uh, few words to help us uh, wrap up this uh, Q&A sessions. So Lucy, uh, lady first. <laughs> sure, thank you so much. This was really a great discussion and a great opportunity to talk about this complex and really interesting topic. So I think, you know, I my last, advice for people would be to engage your organization, engage your staff, engage local survivors in, in having a conversation around what are your ethical storytelling standards and write those down. Share those with your staff, share them with the people that you are working or, with or serving so that they know what their rights are, they know what you're um, standing for. And you can share them with your supporters and your donors as well. We have ethical storytelling um, on our website and I think it's something that people appreciate. And I think um, it's just, it's really an opportunity to educate. It's an, that we have this, as Matt said, this movement has really taken up a lot of steam and this is a great opportunity to take advantage of what's I think the future of storytelling for NGOs. Um, how do we tell stories that are honest, that are dignifying, that are truthful um, and that are beneficial for everybody involved. Beautiful. Um, Matt, would you like to help us wrap up this? Yeah, sure. I hope um, people are still there listening. There was one other question that I want to just touch on quickly in, in, in wrapping up. Someone asked about um, how best to deal with uh, journalists who, you know, an NGO might bring into a story and then the journalist uh, reneges on any promises they made and, and reveals identities or uses photos that shouldn't be used. Um, it, all the all the resources are there. This is a big problem, but all the resources are there for you to 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 weed this out. Um, when a, a, a journalist approaches you asking you to help with the story, you can easily do the research. Go online, research the journalist, and see how they tell stories, and also the organisation. And uh, you can see what the organisation organisation's ethos is, and um, see what they're all about, and 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 decide if you want this person to entrust this person with you know. Um, a survivor who you've potentially helped rehabilitate or, or been there with uh, along this journey. Um, so yeah, I think I, I think that journalism is getting is, is always getting harder. One because the 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 trust in journalists is continually eroded by by both bad journalism and also by um, you know leaders uh, pointing the finger at, at journalism when it isn't actually um, you know when it is real journalism. So I would suggest, and I mean, this is a bit of a plug, but make relationships with journalists because sometimes um, the story, the way that you guys tell a story is different to the way that we can tell it. And sometimes I, you know, I have good relations with a few different NGOs and some who are, who are in this, who are speaking at this conference and some who are probably watching here, but I'd encourage you to reach out to make connections with and, and, and build relations with journalists so that you know when you when you when you've got a story to tell that you can you have the right person that you trust and 
we at the Thomson Reuters Foundation, we have this trafficking and slavery program with uh, 10 different reporters around the world in kind of the, the, the spots that were identified as hotspots. And uh, we're all trained uh, to tell stories in an ethical way. We're also trained in how to deal with, with survivors and, and interview subjects. And I would welcome anyone to, I mean, my contact details are all on here. Um, if you have any more questions or if you want to start to build a relationship and learn how we can, you know, share the load a little bit, because sometimes we can say things you can't, sometimes you can say things that we can't, feel free to, free to reach out to me. I'm, I'm easily contactable. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. I think that's great advice. The collaborations between uh, the NGOs and the journalists. And I think this is, a, this is a movement on ethical storytelling. So we keep on uh, developing and learning. And then I think uh, keep this conversation going. And as both of you mentioned, there are many resources available online. And you can, uh, those who are interested can, and can study that. And then uh, we can continue the discussion flow. So thanks to both of you, Lucy and Matt, and Leia shows earlier for the presentations. So yeah, thank you and uh, for the audience. So I hope you got a lot from both of the Lucy and Matt from what they have been sharing. So thanks, Lucy and Matt. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for yeah. facilitating that. Thanks yeah. for listening, everyone. Yeah, bye-bye.